Drew, who are currently the only remote, list, uh, remote viewers, remote listeners, and I'm seems to have caught it a day. And I'm Sebastian. Um, I am about to introduce the second session for today of, uh, of, of uh, contributed papers. Let me bring up the, the list, which is for some reason refusing to cooperate. Here we go. So we have three papers followed by a discussion with um, Andrew Massey from Middlebury College. Um, Andrew will lead a remote discussion. He was unable to uh, join us here, but was very keen to talk with us about um, his experience of applying Popper's World 3 to um, the area that he has a particular passion for, namely music. Um, so Andrew will join us uh, in the final session. Ray Scott Percival, unfortunately, has not been well and is unable to be here. Um, he has been with us for the last two days, but, but today uh, does not seem, was not able to join us in, 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 uh, in this room. Um, so the first of our three scheduled paper presenters, before we go to, to Andrew, um, the week we have Professor Alil Rahman Acha from uh, Ankara, from uh, Yildirim, Yildirim Yazid, uh, Ankara University, and, and hit, uh, um, the topic will be Karl Popper as an indeterminist. So I'm delighted that you're here. I'm going to give you the mic, and if you could please speak into the mic. Do you actually have a? You don't have a presentation. Yeah. You do have a presentation. Okay, let's find it. <laughs> I think we saw briefly on the screen yesterday. yesterday. You did see it briefly on the screen? Yesterday. Yesterday. Oh, my word. Okay. Wait a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, it's probably... Let's find it. Carl Popper as an indeterminist. There we go. Can we launch? Okay. Um, now... Can we test this? Can you see if you're able to click? <laughs> there it is. Do you want to just point it at the thing and just make sure that it's working? It's yeah, working. Excellent. <laughs> who needs a who needs student technical assistance? Hey, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> <What? laughs> uh, let me give you this because otherwise they won't be able to hear you, Andrew and Rod, who are. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to say a few words before my presentations. First of all, my first interest in philosophy, uh, Popper's philosophy began during master courses, later developed with uh, investigation my PhD topic on scientific rationality, David Miller, as United Kingdom. He was, uh, at that time, in 1994, uh, University of Warwick. I think uh, he was now retired. I have benefited much more his background knowledge and wisdom especially critical rationalism. Some of Popper's book translated into Turkish language. <coughs> the Open Society and It is Enemies, the first book was translated into Turkish language as a two volume the professor Murat Belga translated into Turkish language 
Then, after military forces intervention, 1982, he refused and cut off relationship with the university. It is interesting. Not, uh, Professor Brock Berger also 1,400 academicians cut off his relationship with universities during the 1982. A long time couldn't attend and giving lecture at the Turkish universities. As you know, uh, when the Hitler during the German war and Hitler against Jewish people, but New Turkish Republic opened his university to Jewish people. Many academic philosophers came to Turkey to give lectures. For instance, Reykjavik, the rise of scientific. Many persons then uh, a long time give uh, migrated to United States. It's the interesting case. The philosopher uh, developed by uh, partly helping and Jewish people's contribution. The second book translated uh, for uh, <coughs> belongs to Popper is the power to of stories. Both uh, book uh, Marxist winning lines, left winnings, they don't, didn't like this position. They didn't like the translation of these books. It is interesting case. And uh, <coughs> the later, the other books, uh, the logic of scientific discovery and for better world translated. Some lectures also translated into Turkish language. I think uh, Pabers social philosophy is best known better than his philosophy of science in Turkey. I am very happy to be here among you, to be invited to the conference by Professor Philip. My special thanks to him and his team to organize such a conference. I agreed with uh, <coughs> Mark and Phillips and Jeremy and announced here to be held next conference in Ankara for Popper in 2015, I invite all you, I want to see you there. There is no accommodation problem and restricted maybe uh, flights for uh, persons. All who come to conference, there is no accommodation problem. Hoppers. Uh, it will be held in September 2015, uh, the third weeks, I think, as a popular place. I'm also uh, head of uh, Research Center for Philosophical Foundation of Disciplines in Ankara. <coughs> this conference mainly focuses social philosophy of poppers. 
I think that Popper's philosophy of science at the subject my hand, the this book, the open universe, is important as well as his social philosophy. I believe that each coincide with together Popper's philosophy with deep connection. Popper is not one-sided philosopher. He has many sided. So, <coughs> Uh, I think uh, I shall submit you my presentation in the essence of open universe. It is short and 20 slides only. Then I uh, <coughs> take your comments and discussions. The Open Universe, an argument for indeterminism. <clears throat> As you know, William Bartley Third, the editor of the book, points out that this book will be interested of concern not only philosophers, students of philosophy, but also to wider public. <coughs> The Open University is a kind of prolegomenon to the question of human freedom and creativity. Popper states in his book that he shall discuss the character of our world rather than the meaning of the words. Popper, in this book, presents a critique of both scientific and metaphysical forms of determinism. First of all, in chapter one, he aims to set forth his reason for being an indeterminist and rejecting the idea of determinism. Through his book, Popper criticized the common sense arguments, the philosophical arguments, and especially the scientific argument in support of determinism. He classified <laughs> determinism as religious and scientific and metaphysical determinism. Popper's central issue in this book is to examine the validity of argument in favor of what he calls scientific determinism. Why? Because in scientific determinism, the idea of God was replaced by the idea of nature in modern period, the idea of Divine law was replaced by the death of nature law. So, laws of nature may be discovered by human reason, aided by human experience. So, if we know the laws of the nature, we can predict the future from the present date by purely rational methods. The fundamental idea of scientific determinism was described by Popper as follow. The structure of the world is such that every future event can in principle be known 
recreationally in advance. Thus, scientific determinism seems trench translation of religious determinism into naturalistic and rationalistic terms. <clears throat> to Popper, Immanuel Kant, on the one hand, rejected determinism for moral <laughs> reason, but on the other hand, accepted it as undeniable fact established by science. According to Hopper, Kant was mistaken by accepting Newton mechanics. Hopper also tries to show us that traditional arguments for determinism are invalid. Scientific determinism asserts much more than the existence of causes, much more than the existence of causes. He asked that, are we entitled to infer the deterministic character of the world from the deterministic character of a theory? Is it possible? Popper believes that this inference is also invalid. Why Popper is called him and so an indeterminist? He believes that doctrine of indeterminism is true. Why determinism is completely baseless? He mentions a few <coughs> reasons. First of all, creation of a new world can't be predicted, such as what starts G minor symphony. There are also strong philosophical arguments, partly logical, partly metaphysical against determinism. For Popper, mathematical formulations necessarily represents more or less a theory of some aspects of reality, not reality itself. Now, at this point, is universality, <coughs> like simplicity, characteristic of our theories, he asked. Then he answers, perhaps it is our theoretical language, but not of the world. For example, Newton theory appeared as satisfactory during two centuries. We never feel that some serious objection might be someday. The second argument comes from the asymmetry between the past and future. The past is closed, the future is still open to influence, yet it is not completely determined. The third argument, there are certain things about ourselves we can't ourselves predict by scientific methods. As a concluding remarks, for Popper, both metaphysical determinism and metaphysical indeterminism are irrefutable. Therefore, he wants to refute what he calls scientific determinism and the idea that determinism is justified by scientific experience. In determinist metaphysics, according to him, 
seems to be closer to experience and doesn't seem to create new difficulties as scientific determinism. Further, science itself provides the strongest positive <coughs> argument in favor of indeterminism, for instance, quantum mechanics. There is also one chapter in his book, Indeterminism is not enough. It is not enough for human and human freedom. He needs in openness of world one to three. That is causal openness of two worlds. Interactions between the worlds one, two, three. Thus, indeterminism is necessary but insufficient for human freedom, especially for creativity. Hopper's open rationality then is based upon both nature and society. Man as a part of nature while creating world tree, he transcends himself and nature. Thank you for attention. Like to, uh, yeah, while, you, while you think about whether you would like to hear yeah, I, I may, which is not why I think that my I would have planned to yield it to anyone else. Um, now of course, Popper's ideas about uh, determinism and indeterminism are metaphysical. They're not falsifiable, they're not testable in the scientific sense of the word. Microphone, microphone. Closer. Yeah? Okay. okay. Should, should I repeat for the... No, I heard it. People who are on, on remote... Well, on the remote video. didn't hear me. Okay, well, remote... It's a rule you should stick to. I, I, I made the observation that Popper's ideas about uh, indeterminism and, de and determinism are metaphysical. Of course, Popper, um, Popper introduced an extremely uh, useful distinction. He rejected the logical positivistic idea of metaphysics and the logical positivist thought of missed metaphysics basically as nonsense, yes. things without meaning. Whereas Popper, Popper uh, recreated the place for metaphysics in intellectual discourse. Now, I always find it useful to distinguish between two types of metaphysics. Metaphysics are ideas with content, ideas about the world, that cannot be falsified. And so they're extremely useful, they guide our research, both in ethics, so you can speak of ethical metaphysics, and in what I call factual <coughs> metaphysics, descriptions of, of the world. Now, this, of course, belongs to the realm of factual metaphysics, because Popper has this idea about the world. He shuns, like the plague, the word ontology. But Popper has an indeterministic ontology. He also has an ontology in the sense that he makes a distinction between three worlds. The, worlds, the world of physical objects, our subjective experiences, which he calls world two, and world three, which are the objective contents of our thoughts, of libraries, etc., etc. So, it's a highly speculative theory. Now, I have a question for you. Um, isn't there a sort of circularity involved in Popper's arguments in favor of indeterminism? Because towards the end, you say that the indeterminism is a necessary condition for human freedom. But isn't there also a strain of our argumentation in Popper that uses the conviction that we are free, that we are creative, 
as an argument in favor of indeterminism. Thank you. I believe that uh, what you say partly right uh, about publish to open the individual free will for human freedom. He defended indeterminist metaphysics. But uh, on the other side, in determinist metaphysics and determinist determinism are also metaphysics. But there seems to be contradictions appearance uh, in Popper or that the determinism and determinism and indeterminisms are invalid, he says. Then he tried to defend indeterminist metaphysics on the ontological level for the future growing knowledge closer to truth and truth. So uh, it is not, uh, we can't say clear cut uh, his position in metaphysics. Uh, he tried to open place against the positivist outlook. He succeed in this part, but he has inner uh, contradiction itself, I think. It is not sufficient. He accepts also this one. Okay. Okay. We, we have, uh, unfortunately, with this one mic situation, uh, we, need, we need to. Uh... Okay, oh, wow. Lots of people. Okay, okay. David. So this is, this is very interesting. So what I'm wondering of, uh, have you thought <coughs> about the, the indeterminism and the Not determinism? Mark, have you thought about the determinism and the indeterminism in terms of rationality and reason? Uh, you have this idea, the, the quote that you, that you showed, uh, you, you shouldn't try to infer that the world is deterministic simply because you have a theory that's deterministic. And at the same time, I sometimes wonder whether our faculties of understanding are such that we feel as if we have an understanding of something only through seeing it as deterministic. Which, it, it's, it's, if you think about it, you have that notion that we talked about, I guess yesterday, the night before, the notion of rationalizing the irrational. Well, we are rational, or we try to be rational. And so, I begin to think that maybe what that involves is trying to explain things to ourselves so that we can understand it through sufficient reason. Um, when, the, when the thing that we're trying to explain may not be that at all. But it, uh, I guess it's, it's really associated closely, I, I would think, with, with Kant's idea. Um, you know, we need, we need the categories of, of reason in order to cognize the world. And, and, and Carl was very, he, he was very much a Kantian in that regard as well. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have anything, have you thought about it this way? Yeah, I think uh, I also. I think he criticized the kind, not a uh, completely participated Kantian view, but the uh, interaction between the first world and open influenced the second world and also 
psychological world, the second world, upon the third world, culture and books. So there is no uh, cut off strictly. So uh, we, if we think completely, there is no determinism in Popperian sense, in his view. So he should uh, assert and maintain on the indeterminism for his positions. This is right for him. But uh, in all side, not in, in inside, uh, there may be seen uh, to be weak and supported both side uh, knowledge uh, because uh, conscience and the philosophy of mind today discussions seems to not closed minds upon uh, open mind research and discussions. Yes. Okay. Can I, do we have just one more uh, question? Is that, is that from David? Okay. And then, oh, and, and also from Bill. Okay. Can we take these two questions together, yeah. hand it to you, and then if I may ask Mr. Professor Sketty to, have I pronounced your name correctly? Sesky. Sesky. I apologize. I apologize. Fine. Uh, then we really need to hand over to, to the next speaker. Yeah. Um, I, I never ask questions, I just make assertions. Um, and um, I, I, I want to argue very briefly for the proposition that indeterminism is enough. Um, one of the things that's happened to me in the last few years is that I've finally given up Popper's view of worlds one, two, and three. Not that it's it, not, I don't maintain that you can't distinguish between them. But I do maintain that World 2 is entirely a part of World 1. And I have some sketched out some gestures in my mind to incorporate World 3 into World 1. In other words, there is nothing but physics. Uh, everything is particles in fields of force. Um, now, one of the things that puzzled me when I first read Popper about this uh, dualist interactionism was that um, he just assumes that World 3 is indeterministic. The most natural assumption would be, if you start from a, a presupposition that world one is deterministic, he's looking at scientific determinism, um, that world two would be scientific and world three would, uh, would be deterministic and world three would be deterministic. Uh, but he just takes for granted that somehow um, world two messing around with world three is going to be indeterministic. Uh, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't seem obvious to me. Uh, um, I know my thoughts are very, very... Uh, flaky and floating and uh, inchoate, but then so are many other processes uh, that go on in nature. Uh, and we, we probably think that there is a physical explanation of them, whether it will ever be achieved or not. I'm thinking things like clouds in the sky, uh, which are very poorly understood and may never be fully understood in physical terms. But I don't think any, anybody thinks that they move into another world uh, other than physics. Um, <clears throat> The reason I think, the reason I think uh, indeterminism is enough uh, is this. Well, let me put it this way. There is a common argument that goes like this. Um, either everything is deterministic or it isn't. If everything is deterministic, we have no free will. If there are sometimes bits of randomness, uh, that shows that everything isn't deterministic, but it doesn't give us free will because random uh, events can't be things we're responsible for or things we do. Right? That's a com very common argument, right? Uh, and whenever I hear that argument, I hear it about once a week, um, I become quite irritated uh, because it's, it makes it sound as though there's a deterministic world and then there are seizures of indeterminism. Whereas the way I see it, all processes are probabilistic. All processes. Um, and uh, this is going to be especially uh, consequential um, with processes at the micro level, at the, the subatomic level, like what goes on in the human brain. Um, so um, when I make a decision to do something or not do it, uh, that is a process that's going on in my brain, a uh, physical process, particles and fields of force, nothing else. Um, uh, but of course I experience it differently. 
I don't experience it as physics, I experience it as ideas and so on. Um, <clears throat> that is a probabilistic process. So it conforms to all the requirements of freedom. <coughs> I'm making a decision, no, I'm not being manipulated by other things that are making me make the decision. On the other hand, the outcome is not predetermined. It literally is not predetermined because everything is probabilistic. And it's especially faithfully probabilistic at the micro level. So, what I'm, what I'm, I'm making two assertions here. Well, the, the independence of world three does not do anything to rescue human freedom unless you have an argument that world three is indeterministic, which we never seem to get. Uh, but you don't need it. And it's really irrelevant because indeterminism is enough. Uh, I do make decisions, no one else makes them. Uh, and the outcome of my decision-making process is not just unpredictable in practice, uh, scientific indeterminism, but actually not predetermined. It could have gone differently. Would you pass it to Bill, please? And Bill, uh, okay. Bill could you, when you're all finished, uh, pass it to either uh, John or... Um, and, and, and maybe you'll have one brief comment, but hopefully that will need to move on. Um, yeah, I do have a, a question. I think that, I mean, Popper's indeterminism has always been kind of intriguing to me, and I've always kind of liked his argument that sort of why would God create time if, if we couldn't influence the future, uh, you know, if we didn't have choice. I mean, I'm a sucker for that kind of argument. But I really wonder, two questions. One is, why was Popper, why was indeterminism important to Popper? In other words, what problem was it solving for him? What, why was it important for him to be indeterminist? And the second question is, as you know, uh, uh, Popper talked about, uh, uh, with Agassi and Watkins, about metaphysical research programs. So I'm wondering what research program he thought was served by indeterminism that would not be served by determinism. In other words, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around why this was so important to Popper. Thank you. Can, can we, uh, John, would you, would you mind if I just give you the briefest opportunity to respond, but at the same time ask John to uh, be right beside you so that uh, you <laughs> can take over immediately. Uh, we are way behind schedule already. Thank um, you, David. And Jack, John, also, uh, I think uh, in Popper, Deterministic and indeterminist coincide. But Popper clearly defines um, on part of the side of scientific knowledge, defend the indeterminist position. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you, John, if you could speak directly into the mic, uh, that would be very helpful. Um, okay, thank you. I've got a pretty loud speaking voice. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. I've got, I've got a wife, seven kids, and two dogs, so I can pretty much talk over anything. Yeah, they don't want you to speak into the microphone. So yeah, the mic is important for the uh, people abroad. Oh, okay, great. We're Good using WebEx to, to contact okay. several people. Uh, uh, I'm going to try and move quickly here to keep us on track. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Dr. Banesh and uh, Lebanon Valley College and uh, you good people uh, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, I'm very appreciative. Uh, I most especially look forward to your criticisms so that I can grow from them. The title of my paper is Popperians and the Rationality of Ethical Inquiry. An issue of central importance to the Western ethical tradition is the relationship between reason and morality. This issue is often phrased as why be moral or is it rational to be moral? And for the overwhelming majority of philosophers working in the Western tradition, implicit in these questions is an account of reason that identifies reason with justification. Accordingly, the rational person is one who can justify her conclusions whether the subject matter of a particular conclusion concerns ethics or some other topic. 
Justification is understood to proceed in two primary ways. One, statements are justified because their content is taken to be self-evidently true. And two, statements, conclusions are justified by other statements called premises that are understood to provide evidence for an argument's conclusion. In each case, the justification is understood to be synonymous with good reasons for establishing the truth of some state of affairs. However, this emphasis on justification or good reasons is a noxious contribution to rational inquiry per se and to moral reasoning in particular. Among contemporary philosophies, Karl Popper's philosophy of critical rationalism provides not only the most devastating critique of justificationism, but the most viable account of rationality adequate to moral reasoning. Admittedly, Karl Popper is not known as an ethicist. But because Popper and his followers have done much to clarify the true method of rational inquiry, it is time to investigate how Popper's philosophy can inform our reflections on morality. No doubt the preceding claim is seen as far-fetched in many philosophical circles, since for most philosophers, the refutation of central aspects of Popper's philosophy is considered to be a standard undergraduate exercise in philosophy. Uh, David Miller doesn't say that, but he quotes that in his uh, 2006 monograph, Out of Error. However, in what follows, I hope to show how ill-conceived that conception is. Indeed, the methodological insights of Popper's philosophy both reveal the limitations of the two primary forms of justification identified above and evince a genuinely revolutionary alternative to the quagmire of justificationism that has ensnared Western moral theory. The Popperian ethics developed in this paper advances the following theses or conjectures. One, morality equals a self-imposed system of rational constraints on the pursuit of perceived self-interest. Rational constraints take the form of criticisms. Two, to ask why people should constrain their pursuit of perceived self-interest is to request a justification or good reason or reasons for morality. According to Popperians, for example, Bartley, Miller, Briston, and myself, no good reasons exist in the domain of theoretical or practical action, and neither are good reasons necessary to accomplish anything we wish to accomplish in the theoretical or practical domains. Nevertheless, reason in its critical mode has much work to do in helping to constrain our guesses about ourselves and the world around us. Three. We advance conjectures about which actions will best satisfy our self-interest. Our conjectures are fallible. Most importantly, conjectures are rational to the extent they can be constrained, that is, submitted to critical test. Central to constraining our conjectures is that we do not immunize them from criticism. <coughs> Point number four, and this is perhaps the most important. The principal immoral actions of a universal type, lying, murder, theft, are immunizing strategies. Accordingly, a rational, i.e. comprehensively critical, pursuit of self-interest coincides with the traditional proscriptions of morality. Do not lie, do not murder, do not steal. Thus, in the domain of human affairs, morality and rationality are coextensive, that is, coinciding in logical limits. Consequently, a Popperian ethics can explain that to be rational is to be moral, and to be moral is to be rational. Our get, number five, our guesses about what states of affairs will best satisfy our self-interest often involve conjectures about how to relate to others. Other persons might supply us with criticisms that we ourselves do not think of on our own. The public nature of our conjectures combined with a fallible mindset requires a world that is transparent to the critical inquiry of others. <clears throat> Consequently, a genuinely moral society must be an open society, the topic of this conference. Point number six, the Popperian ethics to be developed in this paper can explain our interest in morality. Because we seek to constrain our conjectures and because to do so involves avoiding immunizing strategies, we must now take an interest in morality. This interest in morality does not require the development of moral categories, the good or the right, that reason in its practical mode is a means to realizing. That is pretty much the traditional approach in Western ethical theory. Moral categories are neither antecedent to critical inquiry 
nor exist as an aim that practical reason directs us to satisfy. The exercise of reason in its critical mode contemporaneously gives rise to moral prohibitions. The presentation that follows develops the above theses in greater detail. To this end, two central topics will be addressed, a Popperian critique of good reasons and morality in the open society. And of course, my papers have to be out of order here. Against good reasons, general comments. Popperians provide us with important criticisms of both types of justification indicated in the, paper, in the paper's opening paragraph. However, the paper's focus is on two, number two, that is, on justifications that emphasize the relationship between an argument's premises and its conclusion. This follows because even those thinkers who hold that some claims are self-evident, for example, moral intuitionists, employ what they assert to be self-evident moral claims as premises to establish conclusions understood to follow from those premises. Accordingly, as explored in this paper, the term justification or the equivalent expression to provide good reasons is qualified in the following two ways. 1a, for a conclusion to be justified, the evidence advanced in its favor, i.e. the conclusion's premises, must logically imply the conclusion, and 2a, the subject matter, or what I shall call the material informative content of an argument's premises, must be related to the conclusion at issue. That is, the state of affairs asserted in the premises and the state of affairs asserted in the conclusion must have enough shared informative content such that the premises are taken to provide evidence, conclusive or merely sufficient, for the conclusion. The Western ethical tradition has concerned itself with justifying its ethical conclusions in exactly these two ways, where 1A and 2A are taken to be jointly necessary and sufficient requirements for rational behavior and or decision making, and 1A is a formal property and 2A material property. To help clarify how these two requirements work together as part of the justificationist project, consider the following example involving a comparison of two arguments. If ice is less dense than water, then ice floats. Ice is less dense than water, therefore ice floats. If it's a duck, then the New York Yankees win the World Series. It's a duck, therefore the New York Yankees win the World Series. Each argument is a formally valid instance of modus ponens. However, in the first argument, the fact that ice is less dense than water is understood to be material, materially relevant to the conclusion while in the second argument that something is a duck is materially irrelevant to the quality of baseball required by the New York Yankees to win the World Series. Consequently, comparison of the two arguments show that to label the premises as good reasons, it's not enough that the premises of an argument validly imply its conclusion. Instead, what is required for the premises to provide good reasons for the conclusion is the premises must both validly imply the conclusion and the material content of the prem premises i.e. minimally the content other than the purely logical operators, supplies evidence for the conclusion advanced. Informative content or material content, uh, Popper and Miller demonstrated in their 1986 paper on uh, deductive dependence can be expressed in the probability calculus uh, as 1 minus the probability of B equals not B. Whatever is left over is obviously the material content. Although aspects of the justificationist project have come under attack, especially in the domains of metaphysics and epistemology, think of Derrida and that crowd, it is uncontroversial to state that on the whole, the commitment to justification or supplying good reasons is a standard fundamental to the discourse of philosophers in the Western ethical tradition. Contemporary authors addressing moral epistemology are less sanguine than prior thinkers about the prospects for an adequate and full-fledged account of justification but their commitment to justification is nevertheless unwavering. Zimmerman is characteristic when he writes, it seems we must set about examining the various ways in which our moral beliefs might be said to be justified or unjustified without first having anything like a definition of justification in place. In the section that follows, the paper articulates Popperian arguments against both deductive and inductive justification. No claim is made for novelty in this part of our presentation, except for the extension of these arguments to the domain of ethics. Okay, so you might hear some things you're probably familiar with. 
and I'll move along if you are. Popper and Miller, since the publication of their 1986 paper on deductive dependence, have enjoined us to see the problem situation of the relationship between an argument's premises and its conclusion as one of degrees of deducibility, where our options are complete deductive dependence, no deductive uh, dependence, which is characteristic of induction, and a degree of deductive dependence as represented by the function Q, which is a measure of the content of an argument's conclusion that resides within the content of the premises. Miller writes, the interpretation of the function Q as a measure of deductive dependence is encouraged by the fact that if the familiar function, 1 minus the probability B of B equals the probability of not B, is adopted as a measure of the informative content of B, and if the content of, uh, getting a little technical here, I apologize, uh, of C uh, over the content of C given A, the proportion of the content of C that resides within the content of A is its deductive uh, consequence. Okay, so I guess what I'm trying to stress there is just that you know their paper emphasized degree of deducibility and that there's three basic types. You know, completely deductive where the the content of A uh, is the basis for all the content in C. Uh, induction, which uh, there is no deductive relationship between premises and conclusion, and deductive dependence, where they're exploring the degree of deductive dependence, or the degree to which the content of the conclusion is contained in the content of the premises. Okay? Although aspects of the justificationist project have come under attack, oh, I already read that, sorry. Let's take a real, uh, a quick look at uh, a critique of conclusive deductive justification. To be clear at the outset, it's important to acknowledge that the demand for conclusive justification has a unique prominence in the domain of ethics. This prominence exists because moral philosophers understand conclusive justification to establish certainty as an epistemic slash cognitive state, and actions are often identified as morally praiseworthy or blameworthy based on the degree of certitude an agent is understood to possess when acting. For the justificationist, the more conclusive the justification an agent possesses for her decision or behavior, the more certain she's entitled to be. And for many moral theorists, the moral worth of epistemic certainty is reflected in dictums such as never act with a doubtful conscience. For example, the prohibition not to shoot at an object in the shadows unless the shooter is certain, or at least the certain circumstances allow, that an innocent person is not likely to be injured or killed. Consequently, moral philosophers have been motivated to emphasize justification as they pursue epistemic certainty as a positive quality of morally praiseworthy decisions and actions. Central to the question of justification is how requirement 2A, that material content requirement, can be satisfied. For what has been recognized by Popperians but not adequately grasped by other philosophers is that formal validity in the transmission of informative slash material content from premises to conclusion are not one and the same. Yet for the justificationists, the material relevance of an argument's premises to its conclusion is essential to evaluating the merit of the premises as evidence. However, material content can only transmit from premises to conclusion deductively or inductively. And in what follows, it is shown that neither deduction nor induction is adequate to satisfy the demands of the justificationist project. Accordingly, once the distinction between formal validity and the transmission of material content is properly understood, it can be seen that for the justificationist, requirement 2A, the material or informative content requirement, cannot be fulfilled. It was Popper's student Bartley in Bartley's The Retreat to Commitment who asked us to consider that in the name of justifying their conclusions, empiricist philosophers of science have erroneously assumed that the empirical character of a set of premises is deductively transmitted from the premises of an argument to the argument's conclusion. Philosophers have been led to think that empirical character is deductively transmissible from premises to conclusion because other evaluative factors such as truth and probability are in fact transmissible. Okay? Uh, a probably true premise is not going to yield you anything more than a probably true conclusion. A deductively valid argument, the truth is transmitted from the premises to the conclusion. Falsity, of course, is retransmitted 
from the conclusion to the premises if the conclusion is found to be false. Uh, just explain that so we won't go on. Let's see. Uh, Bartley adds, indeed, the demand for justification makes undesirable any property unable to justify its derivatives by lending them its own respectability. Now, it's a commonly recognized fact of elementary logic that any inference having a tautology as a conclusion is necessarily valid, right? Because tautologies are necessarily true statements. If you've got a tautology as a conclusion, there's no way uh, that you could have all true premises on a false conclusion because the conclusion is a tautology. However, a tautology is a vacuously true statement. That is, it's devoid of all empirical character. Consequently, even if the premises of an argument having a tautology as a conclusion have any empirical character whatsoever, the empirical content of the premises is not deductively transmitted from the premises to the conclusion, and thus the argument's premises do not lend their empirical respectability to the conclusion derived from them. So you can imagine, we have premises, empirical character, empirical character, conclusion, tautology, because the conclusion is devoid of any empirical content, the inference is valid because you don't have all true premises and a false conclusion, but there's no transmission of content, okay? Uh, comparison to Hume's critique of the inference from facts to values is helpful to appreciate the central claim under consideration. Hume argues that a deduction from facts to values is invalid because the conclusion contains a new relation not found in the premises. So you have fact, fact, value, the question, you know, how do you get that value in the conclusion when it wasn't in the premises? Uh, Bartley's going to argue the same way concerning informative or material content when the conclusion's a tautology. You've got a valid inference, but no transmission of content. Okay? Uh, the idea is that this would undermine uh, the prospects for deductive justification. Now, adding to our understanding of the limitations of deductive justification, David Miller in his 1994 monograph, Chapter 3, and 2006, Chapter 4, develops a central insight of Mills and perhaps Peter of Spain that all deductively valid arguments are question begging. That is, the content of the conclusion of a deductively valid argument merely restates what's implicit in the premises. Thus, the project of deductive justification is not salvaged even if we ignore Bartley's critique and admit both the deductive transmission of material content from premises to conclusion and the transmission of whatever merit the premises <coughs> have as evidence for the conclusion. Consider those contexts where the content of the conclusion is one with the content of the premises. First instance would be where the uh, argument's conclusion is a restatement of its premises. June is in Naples, therefore June is in Naples. Another instance would be where the argument's conclusion is not a restatement, but an instance of its premises. All apples are fruits, therefore some apples are fruits. Based upon the notion of class membership and allowing for the existence of both apples and fruits, each argument is deductively valid because the conclusion is a restatement of what is contained in the argument's premise. However, in each argument, the premise is only a good reason for its conclusion if a statement is able to provide evidence for itself i.e. it's self-evident. Yet how it is intellectually respectable to empower a statement to be a judge in its own cause is a question that no one's been able to explain to anyone's satisfaction. Miller writes that H applies H is uncontroversial enough. That H provides a reason in favor of H is nonsense. Now, induction at the theoretical level okay, is another uh, attempt at justification. Uh, we're all pretty familiar, I think with uh, Popper's criticisms of that approach. The one thing, though, uh, I would like to quote, I think it's a very profound statement, and this is from Miller. He asserts uh, the following. Inductive inferences are problematic because no test of the evidence asserted in the premise is a test of the conclusion's content that goes beyond the content designated by the premises. Miller argues, in a word, the part of the conclusion of such an inference that does not follow from its premise is not tested by testing the premises, and therefore should receive no support from the premises. I cannot see why this objection does not apply ruthlessly to any form of ampliative inference. Okay? 
The critique of induction, of course, is also supported by, if we try and explain induction along probabilistic lines, in terms of the inverse relationship between probability and content that Popper first talked about in Conjectures and Refutations in 1960. Okay? Uh, again, any inductivist on the theoretical level would have to uh, address that inverse relationship. I want to talk for a moment about the irrelevance of justification good reasons in the practical domain, since that's the domain of ethics. This section is subtitled Nino's Quandary. The aim of this section is to explain that good reasons are irrelevant to rational decision making and practical action, and thus are not of any service to moral reasoning. The unusability of good reasons in the practical realm was vividly brought home by Miller, but owes its origin to Plato. Miller, in his 1994 monograph, rehearses the following exchange between Plato and Mino from the dialogue Mino, Socrates. Let me explain. If someone knows the way to Larissa or anywhere else you like, then when he goes there and takes others with him, he will be a good and capable guide, you would agree? Mino, of course. Socrates, but if a man judges correctly which is the road, though he has never been there and doesn't know it, will he not also guide others aright? Mino, yes he will. Socrates, and as long as he has correct opinion on the points about which the other has knowledge, he will be a just, he will be uh, just as good a guide, believing the truth but not knowing it. Mino, just as good. Therefore, Socrates, therefore, true opinion is as good a guide as knowledge for the purpose of acting rightly. Mino, it seems so. So right opinion is no less useful than knowledge, Socrates says. Mino, except that the man with knowledge will always be successful and the man with right opinion only sometimes. Socrates, what? Will he not always be successful as long as he has the right opinion? John, Mino. Could we be in the we be winding up? It's, we're getting to the end of the time. Oh, are we? Sorry. I think, as, as, um, is that right? I, I must Am I? Are we? Sorry. I'm jumping ahead then. Okay, apologies. Thank you. Oh, okay. Not sure where to go. Finish the story. What's that? Sorry. Could I yeah, react to the uh, speaker? Or? Well, well, can, can, can I wait until the Yeah, I just go. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I apologize. I that was no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I don't want to, uh, you know, if I'm going beyond my time, that's my fault. Uh, I was going to talk about there's a very interesting challenge to uh, the Popperian <laughs> ethics that I'm trying to advocate here, and it comes from uh, Lewis Carroll. Uh, uh, well, uh, the challenge comes from uh, instrumental reason. The uh, instrumental argument, I'll just uh, state it real quickly here. We won't get to talk about how I use Carroll as a rejoinder, so, but that's okay. Uh, the Popperian account of morality developed in this paper asserts that a rational person is a moral person because a rational person as a comprehensively critical thinker does not employ immunizing strategies and immoral behaviors, lying, murder, theft, are unabashedly immunizing strategies. As well, a comprehensively critical thinker does not seek good reasons for her conclusions, since good reasons are not something we can reasonably make sense of. However, an instrumental approach to reason seems to provide a serious challenge to our Popperian ethics. Consider the case of Bill and Mary, Bill desires Mary, and Mary stipulates that for Bill to have her, he must do he must do at least one of three things. One, give her the moon. Two, provide her with a drink from the fountain of youth. Or three, murder Ted. Critical reflection reveals to Bill that G and Y, uh, giving her the moon or giving her a drink from the fountain of youth, are eminently unobtainable. On an instrumental account of reason, T is the most reasonable way, murdering Ted, to satisfy Bill's desire. However, T, murdering Ted, is commonly recognized as immoral. Thus, the instrumental approach to reason appears to provide us with a counterexample to our Popperian ethics. Since the case of Bill and Mary provides us with an instance of instrumental reasoning, we're performing an immoral act, i.e. engaging in an immunizing strategy, is a good reason for a desired end. My point is, I have a rejoinder that I, which makes use of uh, Lewis Carroll's paper, uh, What the Tortoise Said to uh, Achilles. But uh, I don't think I'm going to have time to rehearse that argument. Uh, so if anyone wants to, we can talk to, uh, we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, 
I'll tell you what, I'm going to stop there, although I make a relationship between the open society and the account of morality that I provided. Uh, uh, just real quick here, one sentence. Uh, a, totalitarian, a totalitarian state is a closed society. A closed society, as I explained in my 2007 monograph, radically merges political aims, political practices, and political procedures such that none of the three can function as a check on the others. In a closed society, uh, political aims can't function as a critical check on actual political practices. The uncompromising union of aims, practices, and procedures is an immunizing strategy, and in light of the argument in this paper, we can see why such a practice is immoral without appealing to notions like the good or what is right as antecedent conditions. Uh, no, I'll stop there, sorry. Can, can we distribute the mic? Uh, I think David put his hand up. John, yeah, anybody, and sure. Also, Jake. Jack, uh, yeah, would, that, would that be okay? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I'll be right. And, uh, uh, um, well, so, okay. Instead of concentrating on um, relationships between statements, as you do, because you talk about the validity of, of arguments and things like that, I've always thought that uh, Popper's suggestion about ethical inquiry uh, is that we shouldn't talk about statements, but about theories, because ethical propositions mm -hmm. um, are not made in a void. They have, for instance, factual presuppositions. There's a good, it, there's a good uh, principle okay, which, which is uh, often re reconducted to cut that ought, ought to imply can, right. which is an important criterion for putting someone's an uh, ethical theory, as I like to call it, to the test. Mm -hmm. It's a necessary condition. As is the validity of arguments within an ethical theory. But that's, but that's not a necessary condition. Mm -hmm. Now, as to the good reasons, um, Popper confesses that he has an unreasonable belief in rationality. And that he can give good reasons. But what does he mean by giving good reasons? He means that he is open to criticism. Because it's, 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 it, it, it risks becoming a, work, a, a word play. I, do so, I try to convince you of the superiority of my um, preferences or ethical theory or whatever you like. And then I remain open to your criticism. But I can anticipate your criticism by already giving reasons that may take away the ground under your expected by me criticism. So good reasons are okay. What is not okay are good reasons that you don't want to have challenged, that you appeal to as ultimate principles on which you are not willing to yield to rational criticism. Can, can we take all the questions I, I and then have answers? Oh. Yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do my best. Yeah. I think we more or less agree once again. Uh, yeah. oh, I mean, if, if, <laughs> I mean if, if you follow this idea that there are no good reasons, I think you, you, have, you ultimately destroy Popper's philosophy. Uh, I mean, surely he thought that there were good reasons to reject theories. That reasons that might show a theory to be false or at least contradict a theory. There are good reasons to, you know, that's what falsifiability is all about. I don't agree with that. I'll come back. That, there, that you don't believe that, you don't agree that there are good reasons to think that the theory is false? That's correct. Okay, then we have to talk about that. We do. Uh, just real quick, I think you're confusing, okay, what we would call uh, what. I think you're trying to identify as good negative reasons with the instance of a theory's falsity, okay? Uh, the instance of a theory's falsity is to show, for example, you know, that your major premise is false, but if the conclusion, okay, is a deduction from that false statement, then it's just an inference, it's just an inference, uh, or it's just an instance of the theory. An instance of a theory can't be a reason for it. Look, it's the modus tollens. If, 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 if I said my theory is true, then this will occur, and this doesn't occur. That's that it. gives me that gives me a 
reason to reject the antecedents of my consequence. No, it's an instance of your theory's, oops, sorry, it's an instance of your theory's falsity. It's not a reason for believing your theory's false, it's an instance of it. it In the same way, it, it, wait, it but, <laughs> to reject no, but like, you know, if I say all apples are fruit and they validly conclude to some apples are fruit, my statement some apples is just an instance of the premise that I began with. The same applies when it, you're talking about the falsity uh, of uh, a particular, of an actual falsifier of a theory. Look, the have, the falsifier have, is an instance I, I have, of X is, have, of the theory's falsity, not a reason to believe that the theory is false. It's an instance of it. Why didn't say anything about reason to believe? I said oh. it's a good reason to reject the theory. Okay. I didn't say anything about believing. And first of all, you, you, I don't think it's a good reason, though. I think it's an instance of well, excess falsity. If we have no good reasons to reject theories, we don't have critical rationalism. And if we have no good reasons to reject theories, we don't have false can, can we Can we bring in the last two individuals who sure, indicated? Sure. And then, and then um, John, do you still want to? Yes? Um, <coughs> the, and, then, uh, and then we have Michael. I'm going to act out of character because I actually am asking a question because I'm genuinely puzzled, although it could be because my mind wandered at a crucial point in your argument. Um, I thought you said at one point that a rational person is a moral person. Yeah, I want to make that relationship between um, rationality and morality. And morality and I didn't see, uh, you made a quick argument which I didn't quite grasp, and, I, and after thinking about it, um, it sounds to me as though that's obviously false, uh, in, the sen in the obvious sense that you, that you could have somebody who was extremely rational, uh, got a great thrill out of ritually killing people, um, and um, was able to survive and prosper and get on in the world while being a serial killer uh, by night. Um, that person would not be moral in the normal sense uh, and it would be difficult to offer him an argument if he didn't start with a moral premise to get him to dissuade him from this but he would be completely rational i i, I disagree with that oh, okay. Okay. yeah let john John. Go ahead. John. Go ahead. And, and, then, and then we'll come back. I, I just have a feeling that instantly we'll, we'll switch to one. You may answer both my question is, I can see that lying, cheating, and stealing, and, and even murder could sometimes be immunizing strategies. But presumably you're saying that they are always <laughs> and only immunizing strategies. Yeah, but they are. And that's why they're immoral. So I don't, that, that I don't, that's what I don't follow. No, that's why they're irrational, is my point. Okay, so, but, but, right, but why, why, are they, why are they immunizing strategies under every circumstance? It seems to me you could... If the gentleman he describes likes to kill women at night, in what sense is that an immunizing strategy? That's my question. Well, I mean, the whole point of well, the whole point of uh, strategies like lying, theft, and murder, I would assume, would be to not get caught, right? No, but wait a minute. He enjoys it. Okay, but there. David, it's David. Mm -hmm. David was making uh, an argument I would ask you to consider from an instrumental account of reason, uh, which can take the form of modus ponens. So that was where I was trying to go with the Bill and Mary thing, but I didn't get a chance to get there. But, you know, uh, if Bill desires Mary, then, you know, Mary wants him to murder Ted. Bill desires Mary, therefore, you know, murder Ted is an instrumental argument. But I think there's a very important critique of those types of instrumental inferences that come from Lewis Carroll's uh, 1895 paper, okay? Uh, so I didn't get a chance to get to that, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I, 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 appreciate, I, I apologize for having uh, to, to intercede and, and to ask uh, for us to move forward. Michael, would you, would you please? Sure. Michael. So Mike, Mike Duggan, uh, we are, I, I apologize for this, we are running a little bit behind and it seems to be the uh, blame the organizer for this. Um, and we do also have Andrew, um, who will lead a very brief discussion. But uh, Michael, will I kind of do this? Thank you very much. Thank you. That was exactly the point of our uh, okay. to commit. Thank you all for having me. Um, I know we're running a little bit late here, so I'm going to keep this fairly short. Um, before we start, I would like to start off with a few disclaimers. Uh, first of all, I work for the federal judiciary. And I'm going to be talking about 
Does the people the light up? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, because people are, uh, remotely people will able to hear you if, if you're I'm not sorry? directly into the mic. Uh, directly. We have three or four people online. Okay, maybe I can raise this a little bit. I'll just switch over here. Um, but anyway, I'm going to be talking about, uh, about an article that I wrote about four years Mark, ago. You you What's that? Directly into the mic. Eat the mic. Directly into the mic. Here we go. Okay. Mic into the mic. Uh, I do work for the federal judiciary, and I want to make it very clear from the start that in no way do I represent any opinions from where I work or that I'm here on their behalf. These are just my own views and uh, the people, of course, who I cite in my paper as a scholar. Uh, that's the first disclaimer. The second is that uh, the paper, The Law is Justification and Critical Rationalist Analysis, is a fairly general piece, and it deals with and really discusses some basic critical concepts of Popper and how they're embodied in the actual process of the law. Um, and uh, what the, the law, what I'm talking about here, are prima facie cases, basically litigation, but also what judges do in terms of uh, precedent following decision making. So that's the uh, that's the second piece. It's a fairly general uh, fairly general article. I have a number of them back there if anyone's interested in legal issues and critical rationalism. It's an area of uh, it's an area that, the, that critical rationalism has not really gotten into very much. The law it's, it's still kind of a wide open field, just food for thought out there. Second, I'd like to mention that back in 2009 2010 when I was uh, writing this. I've been thinking about these ideas for a number of years, but I wrote the paper fairly quickly, and I did not shop it around on B Press, the big clearinghouse for law review articles. I just sent it to the editor of the law review who had published previous articles of mine, and uh, so it would have probably been a good idea if I had shopped it around a little bit. Uh, it was eventually published by the uh, North Dakota Law Review, and the thing about law reviews is that they are they're edited by students, uh, very busy people, more interested in law than philosophy. The paper, of course, deals with critical rationalism really more than it is a legal paper dealing with issues in the law. So I'm not sure they really knew what to make what they really knew what to, to make of it in some ways. And if you do get the, get one of the, uh, the copies of your articles, I do apologize ahead of time. Uh, there, I think the last round of edits was not fully made. There are a few mechanical errors. It doesn't change the substance of the paper, but it, it does. Um, they do jump out at you, so I do <clears throat> I do beg your indulgence. Um, also, the, the, the topic too, generally speaking, about justification and adjudication and uh, litigation and juries, it's, it's a fairly broad topic for a paper, I don't know what it's about, maybe 60 pages, it would probably have been a better, a better as a monograph, I think. So, so it is a little bit broad there, it is accessible, it's, it's, it's readable, it uh, has some, uh, some theory in it, but very few formulas. Uh, but again, it's, um, it's, it's dealing with the problem of induction and more specifically justification. I know that all of you know about Popper's philosophy of science, so I'm not going to talk about I'm not going to explain or anything the, um, the problem of induction. The article looks at the problem of justification in the law and examines the questions whether judges, juries, and trial attorneys prevent affirmative reasons in support of their positions, theories, and conclusions, or if they attempt to test them critically, as with the deductive component of scientific uh, method, of course, falsification, negative rationality. Many of us who have seen a large number of appellate cases and are familiar with legal research and are quite intimate with what lawyers do in the courtroom realize that the law is really an exercise in justification. There are instances where deduction is brought in. There's actually the introduction of science as you know, there's exculpatory evidence which can dis disprove a theory. And of course there's things like genetic evidence which is also exculpatory. Uh, DNA evidence which is the actual use of science in the law. But, uh, but, but again, I think for many of us of a critical temperament, the law is most an exercise in justification. So in, in the law, as in science, we must choose between theories, but what is the basis of preferring, preferring one explanation, theory or conclusion in the law over another? Uh, is it the critical discussion and testing of competing ideas generally associated with science? Or is it the partisan and prejudicial selection of evidence supportive or sympathetic to one's asserted position, more typical of purely adversarial activities such as forensics. My view is that it's the latter, the dominant activity, is that the law's decision-making involves verification or justification of judicial opinions by providing affirmative reasons in support of the conclusions embodied by the opinion. Um, 
Similarly, the active process of the law is litigation in prima facie cases. Fundam is fundamentally an adversarial activity. It deals with situations, uh, complex human situations, and are not really reducible to physical laws and universal constants, as with science, which we can test through falsification. Therefore, when lawyers present the case, they provide reasons for their positions and the interest based on outcomes rather than a dis dispassionate sorting out of relevant facts. The purpose of litigation, unlike science, when done well, and I won't talk about the sociology of science, I'll talk about when someone Popper talks about science being done well, is not the discovery of truth rather than to represent clients and to win cases or else to bring the case to the most favorable conclusion or outcome for their clients. What is more is that although we may try modest means to reform the laws, that is a practical activity, there's fairly little we can do to fundamentally change it. We can do things like perhaps uh, depoliticize the selection of judges. I don't know how you do that, but, uh, but instead of making it a process of a political body de deliberating, making it something that comes more out of the, the, professional, uh, the professional bodies like the ABA perhaps. Um, another, another example might be uh, tighter rules of court and this sort of thing, but once you do that, you get into the, the, the jurisdiction of judges. So judges, uh, I would think, probably don't like that sort of idea. So again, I think this is a problem endemic to the law. I don't think it's something that can be fundamentally reformed. Now, before looking at this topic, <clears throat> I think it's important to understand what the law is and what it is not. Uh, as with Popper, I am a, uh, an ontological realist, and I believe that the law is what we say it is. The law does not exist like I, I don't believe morality does. I don't, I don't believe in moral rationalism. I think that morality, unlike the law, is, um, is more of an emotional thing. I, I'm more of a sociobiologist on that score than, than a Kantian or a Wellsian. But I am a realist, uh, and I believe the law is what we say it is. It doesn't exist in an external sense, as say the laws and constants uh, embodied uh, by, by physical laws like gravity and electromagnetism. If a person jumps out of a window in headstrong defiance of the law of gravity without a technological countermeasure, he or she is quickly reminded of their mistake. On the other hand, if someone breaks the law, if someone violates your Fourth Amendment rights, and you or law enforcement takes no affirmative action to address the infraction, nature makes no law like correction. The law then is an activity that emerges from, the, from a political process and is a part of the same overarching power enterprise that includes, that includes legislation, economics, and even war. Specifically, the law is how we settle disputes in lieu of violence, although far from ideal, it is much preferable to violence, obviously. Unlike formal truth, math, logic, or uh, well, metamathematics, uh, um, uh, physics, there is no, and, and I'm really referring to, uh, to falsification in scientific activities here. There's no singular activity or kind of methodological operation that characterizes the laws. It is a composite enterprise of jostling elements, borrowing from any number of disciplines and activities, and which includes such incongruous aspects as the rule, the exception, new legislation, black letter law and dusty old reporters, angry or sympathetic jurors, ambitious prosecutors with nine of public office, ambitious defense attorneys trying to make a reputation in their professional community, Legislators trying to solve practical problems, but by means that are subject to both deal to deal making, tampering, and compromise. Judges committed to a particular philosophy or interpretation of adjudication. So again, the law is a composite enterprise. Um, at its basic, I think, it, well, it also has the utilitarian aspect to it, a pragmatist aspect that it does look to conclusions. Although I don't think all judges would admit this. The law does include logic; it is one of its constituent elements. But it is not, I don't think, a sort of pure or formalistic type of logic, so much as a discretionary <coughs> logic based on human social intelligence and considerations and, um, and uh, con uh, conditional uh, well, considerations of the context at the time and the individual case at hand. The law includes precedent in the same way that consciousness requires memory to exist. So again, think of memory to consciousness as precedent is to the law. And these are both things that are characterized by flux and it gives them continuity. At its most generalized abstraction, the law is the rule. General compliance with the rule is a reflection of the normative morality and the enforcement of these rules for the minority of people who do not comply with them. If any number of these elements are not present, the law ceases to exist. And I tell my friends who are more idealistic, uh, Kantians and Rawlsians, um, I'm not sure if there are any natural law people still up, but if there were, I would tell them too. And where the law is not enforced, the law ceases to exist. 
So it doesn't exist. With, it doesn't exist with deontological reality, even though it does exist as an ideational reality once it's formulated. But that's that's quite different. As Holmes notes, Justice Holmes, the law may reflect morality, but is not synonymous with it. And there are whole areas of the law that have little or nothing to do with morality. Traffic laws have to do with safety. Anti-graffiti laws have to do with aesthetics. And laws that tell you to clean up after your dog have to do with health considerations. So all of this underscores the fundamentally practical and realistic um, activity necessary for civilization to exist in law. And unlike science, the more theoretical the law becomes, the less clear it becomes. And the less clear, the less effective as a practical and result-oriented activity. Now, I've seen about 1,500 cases, oral arguments at the Supreme Court. And what I found most striking is how fundamentally reasonable the opposing explanations of both petitioners and respondents can be. Now, this should not be particularly surprising, given that reasonable people can and do disagree all the time. And the Supreme Court, as the highest appeals court and final arbiter of constitutional issues, is exactly where we would expect to find the most difficult and contentious cases with very strong rationale on either side. Most surprising is how powerful the rationale, I'm, I'm sorry, even more surprising is how powerful the rationale and conclusions of often widely disparate majority, concurring, and dissenting opinions can be, given that they are drawn from the same fact patterns, sets of circumstances, and are adjudicated in the same politically moderate system by experts of the highest caliber, many instances who attended the same law schools and are based on the same inter interpretations of the same law or the same constituting document. When a justice reads an opinion from the bench, it will oftentimes seem supremely sensible unless its conclusions specifically offend their political sensibilities or moral prejudices, and even then the reasoning may impress us. Then a dissenter will read his or her opinion from the bench, and this too will seem sensible, reasoned, and spot on. You can give an equation of applied mathematics to nine mathematicians from the most diverse backgrounds possible, and they will come up with the same answer or else be wrong. By contrast, you can give nine jurists from the same legal system, again with the same fact pattern, um, the, same, the, same set of, uh, the same set of information, and the result may be any number of permutations or combinations of majorities, partial majorities, concurrences, dissents, and partial dissents. The fact is that the law is not only imprecise, flawed, flawed really, as a system of analysis such as it is, but relative to systems of pure deductions, it is very soft. And again, there's very little we can do about it. In, in the language of engineering, I would say, the law is a machine with far more play in the tolerances than the physical sciences, to say nothing of algebra or geometry. So I think there is a type of reason that does dominate the law, but I think it's the type that Popper talks about in the myth of the framework. I think it's, I want to say it's page 181, but I forget. It's basically where he talks about sort of the soft reason, as opposed to, as basically the openness of mind that leads us into critical discussions that, uh, that allows us to win, win each other over, or at least uh, expose each other to different points of view, um, the, the critical discussions, as opposed to the hard reason found in formal, formal truth. Let me just talk about lawyers for a second. Again, the purpose of a lawyer is not to discover the truth, it's to represent a client. Um, and this allows to, Popper, Popper doesn't talk about juries much, he talks about it a little bit in the logic of scientific discovery. And he sees it as a perfect opportunity to reduce an either or question to a jury for a critical discussion. But Popper was not an attorney, and what little he writes about the law, it's not his strongest area relative to, say, the, of course, his philosophy of science and even the mind-body problem. But when he talks about the juries, I think he's overly optimistic. The whole purpose of a lawyer is to sway a jury. It's not to lead them to the truth. And even, even Justice Holmes said the purpose of a jury is was to lead in a little bit of popular prejudice. Again, the law is related to a normative morality. It's not related to some deontological truth. So when a lawyer gets up in front of, of uh, a jury, what he or she is trying to do is sway them to their point of view. They're going to mix rhetoric and reason. And reason is a part of it. They, if you have a good rational argument, if you have facts, uh, that, that, that's, that's a good thing. But, but the idea is to play it as much to your advantage as possible. It's not to, you know, if you're trying to get to the truth, you should probably not be a lawyer again. The way, the way to think of a, of, I say this without judgment, the way to think of an attorney is as a Greek sophist, the ability to represent any opinion regardless of whether you believe it or not. And I don't want to punch this point too hard, but uh, the perfect attorney would be sort of a case-by-case uh, -case voluntary sociopath, basically to represent a point of view without having any feeling towards it in a compelling way to be able to win people over. So that's, uh, you know, again, it's, a little, it's quite different from the science. Uh, 
um, the strategies that would win an attorney great fame in a famous case would hopefully get a, a scientist discredited for life. So, so this this is the um, this, this is basically the uh, the, the topic uh, of, of the paper. I, I brought I think probably about 20 25 copies of it. I hope you will be indulgent of the uh, of the errors with it. I just wanted to mention one one other thing that people sometimes I think are confused about with the law and try to relate it to science, and this is the role of facts. And um, when we talk about fact, well, let me just say that facts as observation statements have a different role in the world of business, psychology, culture, economics, politics, and certainly the law than they do in the realm of purely physical interaction. In science, facts uh, represent quantifiable patterns based on, based on or governed by physical laws that can often be demonstrated intersubjectively which is not the case in the law where facts, and quotes, purport to represent alleged events that in many cases cannot be replicated. Consequently, so much of the legal argumentation is characterized by clever sophistry, uh, linguistic skills and clever ability to cajole bullying, personal charm or dominance, um, appeal to vested authority, and manipulating and spinning of facts. Without reading and presenting facts objectively, we see that the law can be bent almost any direction. It is arguable that a skillful defense team could win any case, or at least manipulate it toward the most favorable possible outcome, by, <clears throat> by assume, assuming that they could determine the choice and venue of the trial, and whether the, jury, uh, the case goes to a jury or a judge. So I, don't, I know we're a little behind here. I could talk forever on this, but um, let, me, let me leave it there. And if, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. <coughs> Um, I've, I've just demuted the three people uh, listening remotely, so uh, if you're typing on your keyboard, don't, don't type, tap anymore, <laughs> uh, or, or remute. Um, are there questions from the audience? Well, yes, absolutely. Well, let, me, let me take over. It's, it, it's, it's difficult to discuss with only one microphone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, I'm glad to hear from somebody uh, uh, who knows the law that the parallels with Popper's ideas on rationality only go so far. Now, an idea that occurred to me, and I suppose you agree with that, but perhaps you'd like to elaborate on sure. that, uh, using that to make any differences with Popper's uh, critical rationalism a bit clearer, is that what you just described is more typically Situation. Adam, I'm going to mute you again. Yeah. It's more a situation that is typical of, of negotiation. That's right. Negotiation going on between lawyers, the judge, and the jury. Now, a question. Um, in a jury system, it seems to me that there is more room for using charm and all the other uh, devices that you have uh, mentioned. In the past, I don't know if, it, if, if that's any longer the case, but uh, people have tried, AI people have tried to develop expert systems also for legal cases. Mm -hmm. I suppose, after listening to you, that you are very skeptical about that approach. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. First of all, let me grab the mic so that we can... Uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for your question. Um, I think that's right. I, th I think that there are some differences between uh, jury, jury trials and negotiations. I think negotiations, ideally, and, and, and the negotiations are a part of more arbitration sort of thing, uh, where you're trying to give something to both sides and come away with it, where it is oftentimes, in many cases, certainly in um, uh, prima facie cases, uh, criminal trials, even civil trials, it can be a zero-sum game. So basically you're trying to win rather than try to come up with some, something that both sides can take something away from. Uh, but, but, you know, again, I, I, you know, the, the court can bring in expert witnesses that can be accepted by both sides. Um, but I, I am skeptical of this. But, you know, again, they're being brought into, usually by one side, to support a conclusion. However, having said that, you bring in forensic scientists, they may be bringing in real science. And maybe it is irrefutable. I, I also want to make it clear that there are such things as open-shut cases. There are cases there are areas, as say, tax law, uh, there are areas of the law which is more deductive, less controversial, less acrimonious, 
And um, actually, the dirty little secret of tax laws to people who do it love it is it's about problem solving, getting to the right answer. And even though you look at these these um, these treatises and it looks they look like slow death trying to read this stuff, uh, the people who do it apparently like it because it's not acrimonious and it deals with problem solving. But uh, but yeah, I, I am skeptical of of the role of um, of. Uh, of, of experts. But having said that, it, a lot of times it does get to the right answer. I don't know whether you all heard, I think it was last week they discovered who Jack the Ripper was, through genetic evidence. So, I mean, clearly this stuff does have its place in the world. And I, and I wouldn't deny it uh, on, its, on its face. I would take it on a case by case instance to see what they're trying to do and who brought him in and for what reason. Anyone else? Sure. Okay. Are you able to pass the mic yourself? Or do you want oh, I'm to sorry. Yeah. Pass, pass the mic back. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about this, but we, uh, we, we had all our other mics taken away. Well, thank you very much. For a very interesting talk. I just want to make two comments. Yes. Um, the, the one comment is I, I think that the, um, the, the similarity uh, that, that Papa was pointing out be, between um, uh, trial by jury and uh, scientific inquiry really comes down to at some point the person doing science having looked at all the evidence which is never conclusive has to make a judgment and in effect that's what the jury has to do too and in effect also uh, that's what you do in democracy as well uh, that's this concept of um, you know the citizens who are voted making a judgment. They're passing a, a verdict. Um, it, it's interesting for me because um, you worked uh, a bit on the Daubert decision and uh, the use of falsifiability. That's right. Yeah. And one of the things that I think that, um, to remember now, I, I, I think the court actually said it, and I, and, 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 and I have said it too, and, and I think that it's very important. The dissimilarity between science and, and, and the situation in the court of law. Um, and the dissimilarity is, is, is this. Uh, science, especially for Popper, is a never-ending thing. Right. It's open-ended. We can always revisit it. We can always go back to it. Because we're searching for truth in science. In a court of law, well, hopefully you want to get it right. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to get a decision to put a closure to something, and a decision that people will accept. Um, I think that we're, you know, most people are willing to acknowledge that, okay, we make mistakes. Um, if they think that a mistake was made, in a court of law, so long as they, it was an honest mistake being made at, by people trying to get at the truth, they're happy. If they begin to think that old blind justice has their thumb on the scales, that's when people, that's when the judicial system breaks down. So it's a different problem situation. You're not looking, you know, you'd like to get the truth, you'd like to get justice, but it's not the most important thing. It's the most important thing is to put a closure to the case so that you don't get that never-ending um, system of uh, revenge and violence. I think that's right. I think that uh, in, a, in a legal realist sense that the, the purpose of the law is to make, um, well, with the rest of politics, I do believe it is a type of politics, not in, not in the sense of democratic politics, but as a part of the overarching power enterprise that includes economics, etc. cetera, um, that the, the purpose is to make life orderly and predictable. Uh, that, that's true in a macro sense. However, I, I wouldn't underestimate the point, especially if, it, if you, you're involved in litigation, the importance of getting to the right answer, if you feel that you've been horribly wronged. I, I think people make the mistake that the law is morality. The law is not morality. Um, you, you know, morality is, is the inner feelings we have, why we do things right or wrong. The law doesn't care why you do it, as long as you do or don't do it. The law uh, demands, it prohibits, and it enjoins. It doesn't care why. You, you can be the worst human being in the world, but until you break the law, you're a law-abiding citizen. Now, what you were saying about, um, uh, about juries is interesting, what Popper said. I, th I think you're right about that. I think that we, one of the criticisms of Popper is that you can have a scientist who is divorced from the project he's, he or she is involved in. 
And I think I may have been one of Fire Robin's criticism of, of him. In fact, you have to care enough about your question to ask it. Does it make it prejudice? And Popper says no, because we test it intersubjectively. We can replicate the test even to people who disagree with it. Um, but with, with the jury, um, so, so I think that, uh, but the, the problem is, I discuss actually uh, Nietzsche in here too, in his, his second essay in the Genealogy of Morals, where he basically sees law as revenge. And, that, and that, is this the point of a jury to basically put uh, some, as Holmes says, some popular prejudice into it? And that, so you're, the jury is chosen from a community that is involved in the process. It's been offended, it's been violated, and you're asking them to make a decision of guilt or innocence. So I, at one point here I asked, what's the difference between a lynch mob and a jury? And hopefully there is a difference. But again, you know, lynch mobs, mobs generally are the most democratic bodies in the world. They're, they're not liberal bodies. Because, you know, again, democracy is a, is a form of government or a form of a structure of the majority, whereas liberalism is, is a sensibility of rights and, and beliefs. So, but, um, but no, your, your points are very well taken. I, I think that's right. But again, the last thing I'll say is that th there are fundamental differences, even though the law does claim to be an enterprise of discovery. Um, I think, I would agree, I don't think it's a controversial point at all, that the law is in fact closer to the social sciences than it is to the science. Which means it has content and it may be valuable, but it, but it's not, uh, it falls on one side of Popper's demarcation. I think, if I, could do, I think you might be interested in this. Um, uh, I, I, um, because I use this, um, uh, this is the first, the first time you're here at the, at the symposium? Or yes. Have you, so, uh, so uh, we began discussing my, uh, my new book, which is on Hayek and Popper. And, um, but it, in, in that book, in, in the chapter on democracy, I, I do talk uh, about trial by jury. And the example I use, which I think is, uh, illustrates the point that I, I'd want to make. I, I, I begin with the Aristotle, uh, which is supposed to be, you know, the institution of the trial by jury. Aeschylus is Aristotle, and the story, everyone knows the story. Um, uh, Orestes has uh, killed his, uh, his, his mother, who has killed his father. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Orestes' <coughs> mother has uh, killed his father, and that places him into a tragic situation. He has to choose to do his duty to his father, which would be to his, avenge his, his death, uh, or to do the duty to his mother, which is to protect her against harm, and he ultimately decides to, uh, he's going to do the duty to, for his father, he's going to kill his mother, uh, and he does. And then he's hounded by revenge, her, her furies, and they chase him to the ends of the earth, and he appeals to the gods, and um, uh, he appeals to Apollo, and Apollo exonerates him, and that only makes it worse. And then he appeals to Athena, and Athena, Athena begins by saying, I can't judge a case like this. Either, this is too difficult. Even a god cannot make a judgment. So she institutes a trial by jury. Now, in the trial by jury, it comes up with a hung jury. But Athena has the institute, I mean, she is in the role of now casting the decide the tie-breaking vote. And she decides in favor of Orestes' innocence. And the point that I want to make is that the reason that she gives, and this might actually be a case to say that there's no good reasons, but the reason that she gives is that she didn't have a mother. So she's, she's always on the side of the father. So some people make this patriarchy. But I mean, the point, I think, is far more interesting and subtle. She's the only one that could possibly have given that as a reason to decide for arrest. So the point, though, the important point, is that you know, who could accept that except you want to put an end to the revenge, the bloodletting, the cycle of violence, and um, the, the, the amenities, her mother's furies, uh, don't like that decision any better than if they liked it coming from Apollo, but she threatens them, conjoles them, and they decide to accept it. And that's the important point. The other thing, Mark, is that it's uh, embedded in an institutional process, right. Right. whereas before it looked like the arbitrary rule of a god. That's right. And, and that's the thing about uh, the, the law being a, a normative system embedded in a set of institutions right. which I, are I broadly 
acquiesced in. Put it that way. Let, Let me just respond you. very quickly. I just want to say a couple things here. One, I have a very long footnote there where uh, many people don't know this, but uh, Leibniz was a lawyer at first. He went to law school and he, or he got a doctorate in, in any way. I, I love Leibniz. And he, he, uh, he talks about, and it's amazing how modern some of his ideas sound in this respect. He talks about difficult cases and he says that there are like four or five options. And you can flip a coin, you can go with your common sense. He, he, he gives, and these are all still valid choices today. And uh, so I just want to say that, that I think in a democracy, in any culture really, whenever you have a legal decision, you're not going to please everybody. But if, it, if as long as the law is reflective of the normative morality, people will live with the decision. I think that's right. Second of all, you referenced democracy. I just want to say something uh, briefly on that, about uh, democracy being sort of the democratic aspect of the law and getting, uh, depending on your view, getting you know, the, the, the blessings of the people or popular prejudice into a case. Um, I think Popper, I must say, the open society, is something that I found rather interesting. He said the primary benefit of democracy is not any metaphysical goodness about it, but the fact that it's an efficient way to get rid of bad leaders right. without violence. And again, I don't want to punch this point too hard, but I think there have been 45 or 44 kings or queens of England since the Norman invasion, of which about 10 of them are considered to be great. I think we've had about 44 presidents now, about which five are considered to be great. I'm not, I'm not putting in a plug for a, for a monarchy here or anything, but, um, and again, you know, if, if we looked at Queen Elizabeth I, Legacy after four or eight years, it would not have been very impressive. But I'm just saying, uh, Popper saw, I think, democracy more or less. In, you know, other than legitimacy and the fact that he was a strong anti authoritarian, he did also see it in very practical terms. Yeah, right? very practical yeah. terms and very broad terms. I mean, he said, look, there are two and only two forms of government tyrannies and democracies. And what's the difference? Democracies, you can get rid of your leaders without violence and bloodshed. That's right. And that does not necessarily involve all sorts of things that people associate with democracy, like does not necessarily involve majority rule. Right. It doesn't necessarily involve elections. Sure. I mean, there are other mechanisms that you can have to get rid of leaders and to put leaders into office that don't, don't involve elections, but um, they also give you uh, mechanisms that enable you to get rid of your leaders without violence and bloodshed. That, that's right, but it's, what's interesting too is that you can also have radical democracies. If, right. if, you, if you give democratic form to a um, Islamist nation, a, a radical Islamic nation, or if you give it to a radical um, uh, religious nation of another sort, they, they, will rep, they will elect people who represent their interests and their outlooks. So. Totalitarian democracies, exactly. It's a, that was George Kevin's big thing. Anybody else? Any other questions? John, you Thank you very much for having me. Again, I have copies of it back there. If you all have any interest in some of Popper's ideas applied to law, I'd be more than happy to divest myself of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wouldn't mind having a further chat with you. Uh, are you going to stay around for a bit? We'll be, you'll be around for a while. Okay, we'll, we'll have a chat. Um, the very last part of this, uh, so I, uh, if we can, uh, let, me, let, me, let me demute the uh, people who are tuning in from afar. Um, Adam, I don't know if you had any...